believe we have to worry about the Featheringtons and whether or not they're going to have money again. We did that in season two. And now they've added on a fun little twist of they f The sisters are f uh, baby, everybody in this season be fun. Okay, like, y'all ain't special. Kate and Anthony got it in multiple times. Anthony was doing that kind of linga, 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 the thing that he loves to do most to Kate, like, in the first 20 minutes. Like, y'all are not special, okay? Let's get to the back of the bus. Like, I've got other characters to care about. Hi, friends. Welcome or welcome back to my channel. Let's talk about Bridgerton season three, shall we? But before we do that shit, hello, my name is Miata Ade Lovele. I'm an actress, writer, producer here in Los Angeles, and I love all things romance. I've already reviewed Bridgerton seasons one and two, as well as Queen Charlotte, go and find those. What I try to bring to my channel is a sense of fun, excitement, and <clears throat> alcohol. So um, usually I take one to two to three to four shots before I start some of this stuff. But guys, I'm on a fast. I'm on a fast. I'm trying to clean up my body. I'm trying to eat well. So there's only two shots of Kahlua in my coffee. We'll see how messed up I get this time. Okay, before I get into my review, again, I'm an actor here in Los Angeles. Some of the things you might know me from, friends. So many of you guys have been with me for the past few years, so I get so excited to show you guys like kind of the work that I've been doing. If you guys watch Gen V, which is on Amazon Prime, it is a spinoff of The Boys. I am in the first episode. I am so excited. Actually, I'm actually gonna just show you guys a little clip. Warning, there is gore. Marie! Jackie Moreau, Marie Moreau's mother in the first season. Now they could replace me at any time. Again, all actors are replaceable, but it was such an honor to just be there and be on that set, get to meet those actors. So that was really amazing. If you go check out Liquid Death, which is, if you know what Liquid Death is, it's canned water. If you go check out Liquid Death's YouTube channel, they have dropped an animated commercial. I play all the female voices in that, doing voiceover. But if you guys are from Texas like I am, I also did a um, commercial with Reliant Energy back in March. Hopefully that'll drop sometime this summer. And I'm just, I'm excited, y'all. Last year was very bad as an actor with the writer strikes, the actor strikes. We just suffered. <laughs> it was really hard. A lot of suffering. We're still going through a very bad time here in Los Angeles. So I'm just very blessed for the things that I have been able to do. Oh, guys, I forgot to tell you, I got a dog. This is Jojo. He hates this and he is the love of my life. We rescued him last year. He was on the streets and we got him and he is the, like the love of my life. Um, pets are the best. Before I even jump into everything, guys, I kind of want to know how y'all are feeling about the season. Like, I think I'm going to be so much nicer. <laughs> y'all know me. Normally I'm like, motherfucker, I hate everything. I think I'm actually gonna be nicer than most of the people out there. I think most of y'all are more disappointed than I am in this season. Um, I'm just having a jolly good time with the season that I feel like doesn't care about its main couple. And I'm like, cool, great, bet. Let's go along on that journey. But I'm excited to see what you guys have to say. Are you disappointed in what's going on with Colin and Penelope? Are you disappointed in any other characters? Let me know. Okay, but y'all are here, not because you care about my life, Rue, but because y'all want to know how a bitch felt about this season of Bridgerton, right? Um, that's kind of hard to even talk about because we have four episodes. I actually feel like a bad person if I was to even start giving a whole season review about what they did wrong and where they're going wrong here, 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 and here when I don't even have full character journeys for like any of the characters for the season. And it's hard also for me to review this season because I want to let y'all know um, the book has nothing to do with this season of the show. That is not a bad thing to me, but I am going to get into it when we start talking about character development, character journeys, that sort of thing, how I think them changing some of the things from the book means we're missing some of the stuff about the characters, that sort of thing. But I can't, I'm actually going to probably stay away from the book for the most part, simply because the only thing they took from the book was the name Penelope and the name Colin. Ain't nothing in common with this season. So at the end of the day, Miata, how do you feel about episodes one through four? Here's what we're gonna say, friends, okay? Because I got notes, bitch, I got notes, okay? My heart, this is gonna sound so hyperbolic, but my heart was already broken by this show in season two. Just fool me once. Shame on, shame on you. It fooled me, we can't get fooled again. Okay? Season two, the creators told us they did not care about this being a romantic drama. I think I read interviews where they called this a family drama. So if we're going to judge this show and we're going to say, okay, this show is called Bridgerton. 
This show is about the Bridgertons. It is about a family of one mother, eight children, all of the children's spouses, everyone the children have ever met, like just a bartender. Now we're talking about him and his wife or Christopher Cowper. Now she's got a whole backstory. We're gonna just, the seamstress. Okay, now we are gonna talk about her. Oh, this random group of three friends that Colin's hanging out, we are gonna talk about them. Oh, we, if we're gonna take this as a show that's about the Bridgertons, how they, um, how they roll in society, how they interact with people, their lovers, their friends, their enemies. If this show is just about everybody that the Bridgertons come in contact with, which is what I believe this show is trying to do, then yes, I think this is a successful uh, season of television. To me, as I'm watching the show, I'm like, okay, I'm having a good time. Like, I'm not gonna lie to y'all. I am having a good time watching the show. I have laughed out loud. I, I I see the relationships happening. If I am going to watch this as simply a family drama and the things that are happening within the Bridgerton family, I do think that they are successful. Now, having said that, I do want to point out the millions of plot lines that this show has. I am trying to stay away from criticisms about this show online. I'm gonna be real with y'all. Like I am trying so hard to not look at what other people are saying about the show. But I do know just from the rumblings from my friends that a lot of people are very frustrated with how many storylines there are in the show. If you haven't counted them, I'm gonna go through all the characters this motherfucking show wants you to care about in addition to the ancillary characters that they kind of want you to care about. Okay, let's go through the characters, right? So we have one Violet Bridgerton, right? We have seven of her children because Daphne's no longer in the show. So now we are at eight people. They want me to care about Lady Danbury. That's nine. They want me to care about Kate. Okay, that's 10. They want me to care about the queen. That's 11. Now we're talking a lot about the boxer and his wife. I actually cannot believe we're talking about the boxer and his wife this much. I'm going to talk more about them and how I feel like this is a wasted plot line. But again, maybe it's not. Maybe by the end of the season, we're going to see some magic happen. But what the hell? So we have the boxer and his wife. We are now at 12, 13. I've got Lady Featherington. That's 14. Three of her daughters, including one of the main characters, Penelope. So that is 17. I have Curse of the Cowper. That is 18. Um, Benedict, that widow that Benedict's now fucking. Okay, that is what, where do we, uh, was that 19? I got, I had Kristen as 18, Benedict's widow at 19. Then we have our ancillary characters. People like Lord Debling, um, Colin's three friends that we see all the time. Uh, John Kilmartin, which I am gonna talk about John Kilmartin, y'all. I am gonna talk a lot about Francesca because I am loving what they're doing with Francesca. I actually wanna see more Francesca and less of Penelope, unfortunately, because this season is just kind of like, not hidden in certain ways the way I'd like it to. However, we're gonna talk a little bit about, and I'm gonna talk a lot about race when I get to Francesca and when I get to Eloise. When I get to those two sections about those two characters, I will say spoilers and I will try to give a timestamp to just in general, let you guys know when you can come back in if you are not interested in spoilers from books five and six. So I'm gonna get into it because this show, I don't know who's in the writer's room. I refuse to look it up. <laughs> I, I have refused to look it up for all the seasons, but I don't know if they know that when they add people of color, they can't just add people of color and then be like, oh, we did it. Um, even in colorblind casting, we as an audience do not live in a colorblind society. And when you add people of color and then you have bad things happen to those people of color, um, it uh, looks kind of bad. So I'm gonna talk about that, but I'm gonna wait a little bit, okay? But yes. If I think of this as a show that is about a million and 10 people, how many people was that? I think we got to 19 people they've kind of given us a point of view about and then some ancillary characters. Do I enjoy watching it? It's fun, super fun. Now, if you're gonna say, Miata, no, 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 Bridgerton is not a show about the Bridgerton family. It's a show about two people in love. Do I think the show is successful? Come the fuck on, no it's not. However, guys, I already had my heart broken by season two. I went into season two, if y'all remember, and I've talked about this before, season two, the very final trailer that they dropped was nothing but these gorgeous shots of Kate and Anthony. What we quickly learned watching the season was the season two trailer were the only moments of Kate and Anthony in the entire season. They didn't do anything with Kate and Anthony. Now they're trying to do things like episode one of this show, trying to do things like, oh look, Kate and Anthony uh, are having sex. Remember how y'all should have put that in their season? Very cute that y'all are trying to make up for it now, but oh, the boat has sailed, friends. So if we're talking about this being a show, is it successful on a romantic level? I'm not sure it is, but I do believe and I do feel like the creators don't care as much about the romance as we, the audience, does. Now, if you did not watch Queen Charlotte, get off, get the fuck off. Leave my channel, okay? You, you've watched up until now, leave my channel, go watch Queen Charlotte, then come back. Well, actually watch my reviews and then come back. Queen Charlotte has all of the angst 
that you wanted from every season of the show. I think season one of the show, looking back, probably not the greatest, but we were all very excited. Season two of the show, really a letdown in terms of the romance and the focus on the Featheringtons was out of control to the point where it's made me kind of hate seeing the Featheringtons because I've seen so much of them already. Queen Charlotte, which I believe Shonda came back to do the writing on, is fucking... The angst, the heartbreak, the love, the sex, the spice, the everything, everything you want this show to be is in Queen Charlotte. So for me, coming into season three, I had a feeling I was not going to be feeling the Penelope Colin of it all, mainly because I don't feel like the books do a good job of their relationship. So I didn't really care about their relationship. I don't like Penelope in the show. Nothing to do with Nicola. I think she does beautiful work. I don't love Penelope in the show. She's kind of the worst. Colin in the show is a puppy dog. He's nothing like book Colin, which is fine. Totally fine. I'm just saying I didn't care about this couple going into the season. So I don't care that this couple's barely on the screen, to be honest. Like, it, it's fine for me. But if you wanted to see these two people really just having this beautiful kind of angsty love, falling in love, being together, I can see why you may be disappointed by the season. So because we're not done with the season, so because I don't know where things are going to be going, because because there's a million characters and a million plot lines and a million everything, it's hard to know how to break the season down. So what I'm going to do is just kind of go character by character or situation by situation. And it's going to be a mix of all of the things. And I'm going to talk about what's going well so far, what's not going well so far for me. And then we'll just go from there, guys. Then we'll just go from there. I feel like I am having a better time with the season than I think a lot of other fans are. I think if you're a big Kate and Anthony fan and you really believed that the show was going to do right by those characters, I can see why people are upset. I feel like if you really came into the season believing that we were going to have more romance, I can see why you might be upset. I, again, I kind of thought what I wanted out of, a sh out of the show from Queen Charlotte, which again was just excellence, and I kind of already hated the show in season two. So I, I, I don't feel like, I don't feel like I can still be disappointed by the show. I say this fully, fully as a hypocrite, because if they fuck up Francesca's season, and if they fuck up Eloise's season, mainly because those are two of my favorite books, book six and book five are two of my favorite books, I will probably be back here and be upset. So just know that I'm lying to y'all. Like I'm probably gonna be back here like, but I'll get into it. Let's get to my first set of notes, friends. Penelope. I think that Nicola is doing a phenomenal job. She is so beautiful. She is literally glowing this season and she's a fantastic actress. I've had the chance now between seasons to go and watch Dairy Girls. She's so good. <laughs> I'm sorry, she's so good. And she is a deeply charming individual. And so I think even though I don't like Penelope, I like her. And so now I'm like so conflicted because I don't really like the character, but I now kind of care about the character because I care about the actress. You know what I mean? She's such a dope human being. So I really wanted to go into the season and just kind of be like, yeah, great, amazing. I kind of made the mistake of reading book four before I started the season. If you have not read book four, don't. That's so mean, but don't. Book four, Penelope in book four is dope as fuck. Penelope is that bitch, right? Colin is also a bitch, but like in the worst kind of way. Like he's like a whiny bitch. So I don't think you need to read book four. Like I've already said before, I think I already said before, the only thing that this show has in common with the books is that there's a character named Penelope and there's a character named Colin. Everything else, they just, nothing, nothing. There's nothing like it. In the books, what I did like about the book Penelope is Penelope in the books is 28 years old. This takes place, her book takes place 10 years after like the events of the previous book. I think it takes place like 10 years after Benedict's book. She's 28 years old. Obviously we can't do that for the screen, but what I liked about that is for those of us who thought we would never fall in love, we are in our 20s, mid 20s, late 20s, we're watching our friends fall in love and get married. It is so wonderful sometimes to read a book about a woman who's approaching 30 and has not yet found love or gotten married. I feel like books like that kind of gave me hope as I was in my mid twenties. And so that's what I kind of loved about her book. I also was deeply, I would consider myself a wallflower and not because I was shy like Penelope, but because I was so horny, I think I scared people. I was a horny little girl. 
I love boys. I've always been boy crazy. I love boys. And I've always been a lot. Y'all can watch my videos. You can tell, like, I am, like, loud. I gesture nonstop. It was just a lot. It was a lot. Like, my husband loves every part of who I am, and it's amazing. And if you haven't found your person yet, that person is out there, I promise you. No matter how wacky and crazy you are, that person is out there who's going to love every aspect of who you are. But it feels hopeless <laughs> when you are going through it. And so I kind of feel sad that we didn't get a slightly older Penelope. If only also because Penelope, by the time she's 28, she's accepted that she's a spinster, but she's kind of like a badass spinster. She has all of her own money from um, Lady Whistledown. She's enormously rich. She's enormously rich. She's probably like similarly rich to Colin. She doesn't need his money. And so she's not desperate. She's not trying to get out of the house. She has money. She's incredibly confident about her writing and who she is as a writer and, and her work as Lady Whistledown. That being said, we couldn't see that for the TV show. It wouldn't have worked. They didn't want to move Bridgerton 10 years to the future. It, it would just, it would have messed up their timeline for what they're trying to do with the show. I understood that. I actually quite loved that Penelope decided in the first episode, you know what? I'm tired of being who I am. I want to find a husband. She finds her agency. She gets a makeover. I loved that. I just thought to myself, I was like, yes, you guys are giving her agency. Like that's what I was afraid she was going to lose. She's not aged up, but at least we're giving her agency as a character. She has a, a mission. She wants to go forward. That's amazing. But because the show is not focusing fully on Penelope, we're missing so much of what matters to her. Right now in the show, the only thing that matters to her is finding a husband, which I think is fair. But in the book, you know what mattered to her? Her business. She is a boss bitch. She has a business. She has the entire town of London obsessed with her business. She is an entrepreneur making that bread. And the thing about it is Penelope in this show is doing the same. She is Lady Whistledown. Y'all don't understand, she's rich. Penelope is making massive amounts of bread. Imagine that every person in your city read your newspaper every other day and you were making coin from that. She's wealthy. And I think it's kind of a shame that we're not getting to see, at least not yet, we're not getting to see Penelope be a boss ass Lady Whistledown bitch, if that makes sense. Because that is a huge part of her character development in the book. And I think it's important to see that while Penelope is incredibly shy around men, she's incredibly confident when it comes to her ability as a writer. We have not seen any of that. One of the reasons that Penelope and Colin bond in the book is that they both are writers. She writes her Lady Whistledown, he writes in his journal, and she actually encourages him to become a writer. Now, I'll talk about Colin in the book a little bit, but he's a bitch. He's always like, oh my God, my writing. I don't know if it's as good as Penelope's. Like, I'm so jealous and so embarrassed to show her my writing, Link. I have nothing to do in my life besides be hot and rich and dick down bitches. Like, <laughs> I'll get to it. What I want to say, what is partially missing for me from Penelope is that she's not just... She's not just meet Penelope. And something she said in the show is all the things in her, in her heart or all the things in her head don't quite make it out the correct way. But on the flip side, something that Penelope is incredibly confident about is who she is when she is on the page. And I, they might start talking about that. They might start bringing it up, but it is kind of a shame that we haven't been able to see the juxtaposition between a very timid in society, um, a very timid in society Penelope who's trying to figure shit out and a Penelope who is kind of a boss bitch when it comes to Bridgerton. Not Bridgerton, Lady Whistledown. Sorry about that. I just feel like I know there's so much that the show's trying to get through and maybe this doesn't matter to anyone else, but I do think it's kind of shitty that we haven't been able to see her as this like confident businesswoman too, because that's who she is. And um, I think it's just kind of a shame. So, but again, I don't fucking know what's going to happen by the end of the season. For all I know, Penelope's just going to boss, 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 bitch, right? Whew. Let's go to Colin. 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 As an actor, one of the most vulnerable things you can do is acting. <laughs> so I don't like to ever criticize the actors on the show. Again, because I'm an actor. If I was a writer, I probably would criticize the actors and not the writing. But I try to never criticize actors because what we do is so hard. And you guys can tell that Luke Newton came into this season just like, I'm going to show y'all I can be sexy. It was very clear from seasons one and two for me that Luke Newton used to be like a, a, a UK Disney 
kid. Like, I think he was on the Disney Channel in the UK. It came across in his performances. It came across in how puppy dog he was. It came across to me. And so he went away for the however long before they shot the season and he got chiseled and he got like, you know, they gave him the sideburns and they're like, you're a man now. And I feel like part of the storyline is he's pretending to be a man now, but he's still the boy that they knew before. So I understand that I think it is a part of the storyline. It just, nothing's working for me. I think Luke was already having to bat from like a negative a thousand. I don't understand baseball. So if that's the wrong terminology, <laughs> I'm a girl. I don't, I don't, I don't fucking know. I feel like Luke Newton was coming from such a disadvantage already. And again, they skipped Benedict season. If you guys don't know, book one is Daphne, book two is Anthony, book three is Benedict, book four is Colin. They skipped Benedict season because I think they have to completely rework everything about that book because that book is nothing but coerced sex. It is, it, I'm, I, I have friends that love book three. Benedict in that book basically coerces Sophie, I believe Sophie, right? To have sex with him, even though she says over and over again, I don't want to really do this. And he's like, well, I kind of want to do this. So like, like, let's have sex. So anyways, I understand they have to probably figure that shit out. They want to develop Benedict's character more. Um, so they're going to continue to have him have sex with widows and artists. But then we have Colin season and I don't think Colin's ready yet. And again, because they're not focusing on Penelope, because they're not focusing on Colin, because we have all of these people they want to focus on, we're not actually having characters be able to develop over the course of a season. I, it feels like Colin and Penelope get a, a scene at the top of an episode, scene maybe at the like quarter mark, another quarter mark, and then at the end. So maybe they get four scenes together over the course of an episode. But in the middle of that, I'm going to see three scenes with the Featheringtons. I'm going to see a scene with Mama Violet and her getting her Mac on. I'm going to see a scene with Francesca. I've got to see some scenes with Carissa and Eloise. There's no space for these characters, for Colin or Penelope to really breathe. So Colin was already batting from like, right, like from a very bad average. Again, I don't know sports y'all. Then the book a book for Colin sucks. I feel like they didn't have any good basis for this character. In the books, if you don't know, books one, two, and three, Colin is the most charming of all the Bridgerton siblings. Um, Anthony's quite serious. Um, of all the Bridgerton boys. Anthony is quite serious. Benedict is an artist and kind of in his own head a lot. Colin is the charming Bridgerton. They obviously changed that character entirely for the show. Fine. But book four of Bridgerton, Julia Quinn changes Colin's character entirely. He is an asshole from start to finish. And the reason he's an asshole is because he finds out that Penelope is Lady Whistledown. He finds out quite early and he's so jealous of her because she's such a good writer and she's so confident about being a writer and he loves to write, but he feels like he doesn't know what he's doing. And so he's jealous of her. He's jealous she has a career. He has no career. He's a man and he has no career. So in the book, he's jealous of Penelope. He treats her like shit nonstop. Like it is actually like pretty awful. So I feel like they wanted to completely change the character. But as a result, I have a character that I'm so not invested in. I didn't like Colin really in season one. Uh, didn't really care about what he was doing in season two. And now I've got a character that I'm like, cool. You do you, baby. And I feel so bad because that's the issue I'm having with Penelope and Colin is I know they end up together. I'm happy they end up together and I don't care. I, I don't really care. And I am excited though, to see where they're gonna go in episodes five through eight. Hope, I, I know that they're gonna be sex scenes. Nicola has talked a lot about um, being nude and how she wanted to talk, get back at body shamers and how she was so excited to be naked on screen. Um, and I also think she's doing such a great job. It's just kind of a shame that I don't feel anything for either character and I don't know. I, it's so weird. I, I was watching the show and I was just sitting there like, this is nice when I should have been feeling like I need them together. And I have another friend that I'm talking to and no one is swooning. And I know that feels very silly, but in a show like this, you want to swoon. And there was some swooning that happened for me in season one. There was some swooning that happened for me in season two. E even within them barely showing Kate and Anthony, I had some swoon moments. 
So far, I've had moments where I'm like, oh, they're so cute, but there's not the swoon. And that might just be a result of both of them being incredibly young looking actors. Nicola's like my age and she looks 10 years younger than me. I'm so deeply jealous of that. Like, I'm so mad about it. Like, what? Like, black don't crack, but what happened to me? And, you know, Luke Newton, I know he's tried to look older this season, but he looks like a baby. He looks like a baby. So, I don't know. I'm just kind of like, Neh! about uh, those two and hopefully the season can really like, mm, you know, like rev that bitch up. There's some really sexy stuff that happens in the book. He talks about wanting to fuck her in front of a mirror. Yeah, he, he, he talking about doing that dirty, dirty, dirty. So uh, hopefully we're gonna get to see some of that dirty, dirty, dirty. Okay, guys, this is the point where I'm gonna start being pretty spoilery um, in terms of characters in other books. So um, I'm gonna try to put up a timestamp, but I do wanna let you know, I'm gonna start talking about um, characters that I deeply care about that you guys do not know what happens to them in the books. I'm going to try to be pretty quick about it, but if you don't want to know what happens to Francesca or you don't want to know what happens with Eloise in their books, because it will probably be a little spoilery for their seasons, go ahead and skip to Miata. Put a timestamp right around here. Okay. Now let's, uh, talk about Francesca. Love her. Did y'all think I was gonna say I hated her? Bitch, I love her. I forgot, I don't have my computer in front of me or my phone. I meant to look up the actress's name. Um, as we know, they recast Francesca. They re recast Francesca, what, like season two, the actress went on to do like Lock and Key, whatever. They got a new actress. I'm obsessed with her. Um, apparently some people are mad that she's so pretty. What the fuck are y'all? What? Anyway, I think as a person who, I think Francesca's probably my favorite Bridgerton sister. Um, as a person who deeply loves Francesca, I think what they're doing with Francesca is so great. I am so excited. It is a huge problem that I'm more excited about Francesca than I am about Penelope. I shouldn't be sitting here more excited about Francesca than Penelope. I just shouldn't. Or more excited about Francesca than Colin. First off, Francesca's book is book six. We're not gonna, she's probably two seasons from now. That's what, seven years in Bridgerton time? I, I'm gonna be in my 40s by the time I watch this season. But am I deeply excited about what they're doing? Yes, Francesca is the Bridgerton who is the most, as you guys have seen in the show, just the most introverted. She doesn't wanna be around her family all the time. And so what I love, I we in the books you don't get to see the courtship between her and John Kilmartin. You don't get to see it. So what we are seeing on the screen is such a fucking delight. I am, I am so I can't. Can y'all tell? I'm so excited. I I am so excited about what they are doing now. On the flip side, Bridgerton does not have a good track record with their treatment of people of color. A lot of the time. I have complained about this ad nauseum, so I'm gonna go through a few different things for y'all. As I complained about in season one, there were, I believe, seven speaking roles for black women in season one. Of those seven roles, I believe six of them were women who passed the paper bag test. If you don't know what that means, that means they are extremely light-skinned. Yes, even Lady Danbury is biracial in real life. The only fully black, dark-skinned woman that they had in season one was a maid who spoke. All the rest of the dark skinned women were either background or they played maids. So the only dark skinned black woman who had a line in season one was a maid and she said a line in the very last like five minutes of the show. Season two, we got a dark skinned, gorgeous South Asian woman whose storyline was completely overtaken by everyone else's storyline, the Bridgertons and the Featheringtons. We, I don't know if you guys noticed this, Kate didn't even get a fucking backstory episode. I'm never gonna stop being mad about it. They didn't give her anything. We don't We don't know what happened to her when she was a kid. We don't know what happened to her. We don't know, nothing. And all of her shit was in the books, by the way. Like Kate had tons of backstory in the books, nothing in the show. So cool, bet. Now let's bring us, and I'm gonna take us back to season one as well to talk about Marina. I'm gonna talk about Marina. I'm gonna talk about Ruby Barker. I'm gonna talk about Ruby Barker talking about her treatment on the set. I'm gonna talk about that when we get to Eloise. So now let's go over to what we're seeing now with Francesca and John Kilmartin, which is a, I, I am so happy about their courtship because the thing about Francesca and John is they love each other and they get married and they have a wonderful few years together and then he dies. I'm gonna repeat that, John Kilmartin dies. Francesca's happily ever after is not with that man. I believe it's with his cousin, correct. 
So Francesca gets married to John Kilmartin. They have a beautiful marriage and John dies incredibly tragically. And then his cousin, Michael, had been in love with Francesca the whole time. I think he met her right before the wedding, falls in love with her, but it's his, it is his cousin's wife. He tries to stay away. He's deeply in love with her. And then after John passes away, Francesca is basically like a widow, like never want to get married again. But I think she wants a baby. And she's like, Michael, have a baby with me. And Michael's in love with this woman. And it is, if you guys are looking for like a really like, sorry, I'm getting emotional because there's a line in that book that always makes me cry. Um, the, I think it's the very last line of the book where um, John Kilmartin's mom has written a letter to Francesca about being like, thank you so much for, no, John Kilmartin's mom writes a letter i think to michael to say thank you so much for letting my son have francesca first because she made him so happy in the short time he had on this earth which i think is like just so beautiful um sorry I'm, i i cry every time i think about just being like thank you for letting my son have the love of his life thank you I, cool bet um yeah cool so anyways i love book six um, all of my friends love book six. Honestly, if you guys are looking for a really good book, book six is very good. So here's the issue. John Kel Martin is a dark skinned black man who has to die for someone else to marry a Bridgerton. Right? And y'all are like, bet, but his cousin is, is also a black man. So that's cool. Here's the issue I have. And we're going to then move over to talking about Eloise. This show, if y'all don't know anything about Eloise's situation, Eloise is supposed to get married to the man that is currently married to Marina. I talked about this in my early reviews. Marina is a character that never shows up on the page. She is already dead at the start of the book. She had postpartum depression and she kills herself off the page. Like she, they, they talk about it, right? They talk about the fact that it happened already. So in order for Eloise to get her man, Marina has to die. So then we're having the same thing happen with John, right? He's gonna be here, we're gonna fall in love with him, and they're gonna have to kill him so that Francesca can have her happily ever after. I know for some of y'all that doesn't seem like a big deal, but it is a big deal because so often these shows put people of color in positions that don't matter or for them to be killed off. It just, it hurts. And something that I talked about very specifically, if you guys go all the way back to my review, I think of, season one it was my season one my trailer review for that season i talked about the fact that marina was a black woman that they were going to sacrifice for eloise's happiness at the time i said i hope and pray that y'all are taking care of ruby barker that you treat her well that you treat this character well because so often this happens to black women that we are in positions where we are easily sacrificed and at the time ruby barker reposted my video um and a link to my video on her Instagram. And I remember thinking, huh, that's so interesting because I did call out the fact that every woman in the show was biracial. I did call it out. I was like, it's so interesting that Marina's a light skinned black woman, like per usual in these types of shows, but I hope they protect her because as a black woman, we're so often not protected in shows like this. Fast forward to what we see happening, to what we have seen Ruby Barker say about her experiences on this show. It just makes me sad. <laughs> They didn't treat her well. And I am hoping that what they have happened with Marina's character is that she, I've said this so many times that she runs away, that she is, instead of killing herself, she runs away rather than have her kill herself. Because they have, if they have her, if they made up a black character, just to have her be treated like shit in season one, get married to a man she didn't want in season two, and then kill herself off screen, I'm gonna be pissed. We are not plot devices, we are people, okay? So yeah, it's great. John Kilmartin is actually a very, he's such a cute, cute guy. I kind of love him and Francesca together. But if y'all are using us for plot points, it just fucking sucks. And yes, his cousin's gonna be another black man, fantastic. But it's just like black death on screen, just so plot points can happen is not my favorite thing. Yes, this is colorblind casting, I get that. But as black people, our bodies are constantly used as fodder for plot device. It, it has through all, throughout all of cinema. So I just feel like the people in the writer's room are not recognizing that. And I am not the only person upset. I have people in my DMs being like, fuck, like, are they doing this again? And it might not be a big deal to you. Maybe you didn't even notice, but I need y'all to start noticing when black people's pain and black people's depths are used for plot points in TV shows. It fucking sucks. I am kind of like, I know I love representation, but I'm also just kind of like, 
I wish you guys were mindful of what you were doing and how it looks. And we can't divorce race from from anything. I, I don't care how much we, we want to divorce race and colorblind casting, we can't. If I look at something like Queen Charlotte, which I absolutely adored, the dark skinned woman is raped continuously at the start of the show. They played it for laughs. I talked about how it was not funny. She was being raped by her husband. She didn't want to have sex with him. She had no choice to have sex with him. They played it for laughs like, oh, ha ha ha, look at a woman having sex with a man who she doesn't want to have sex with. Isn't that fun? And then she gets with another man and feels freedom and then he rejects her like it just there is like no sense of them looking at culture or trends or history when it comes to race and you have to I don't care how fucking colorblind you want to be you have to okay that's my rant so I already talked a little bit about Eloise god work this video is gonna get kind of long y'all I'm so sorry so I've already talked a little bit about Eloise. What I'm going to say about Eloise is I actually kind of like who she is this season. I kind of like that she's grown up. I know that what she's grown up to be as a person who no longer believes that she can save women and save people from the patriarchy and she's like I'm just going to I'm just going to melt in, but I like that she's dialed down. I have talked a little bit before about how anachronistic I found a lot of the like the choices the actress is making, a lot of like, eh, blah, 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 very the adorableness of it all, and how I was kind of annoyed by it a little bit. And I'm kind of enjoying a more toned down, dialed in Eloise. Like I actually am. I've had people ask me if I thought Eloise's season was gonna happen next or Benedict's season. Now that I'm thinking about it, I think they have so much more work to do with Eloise's relationship um, that they're gonna have to do Benedict season first. So I'm hoping they do Benedict season first. Let's just talk about the rest of the um, Bridgerton siblings while we're here. Kate and Anthony are in the show. They're in the show for a few sex scenes and a few times to be like, guys, look, we're here. Great, fantastic. Thank you for doing that for the fans. You're a real one. But is it enough? I mean, whatever. I can't even be, again, I cannot go into season two again, y'all. So I'm gonna just move on. Great, we saw them. Benedict, the show does not know what they're doing with Benedict. I love what, is it Luke? Thompson. I really like Luke Thompson's portrayal of Benedict so much more than I ever liked Book Benedict. The show it just has this man fucking, he like, who, who are you? Who are you? Want to fuck? And then that's the person he fucks for the rest of the season. They have not figured out what they want to do with him, which maybe that is reflective of what he wants to do with his own life. He doesn't know yet. You know what I mean? So he, him fucking random people is just, just a manifestation of his lost mind. Um, but they're not really doing anything with him so far in this season. And that's because we've got too many people to talk about, motherfucker. Let's talk about Gregory and Hyacinth. No, let's not. They're children. So whenever their seasons come, we'll talk about them. Am I missing any Bridgertons? I think that's all of the kids. Let's talk about Violet. I complained about this in an earlier, I think when I was talking about the books, like I think in season one, how it was kind of a shame that in the books that the, that Julia Quinn never let Violet Bridgerton fall in love. Um, something that is reiterated in every single book is that Violet Bridgerton will only ever love her husband and she will never love again. The only people that she can love are her children. This is actually so good. Mm. No, I, I need some more of that. So the only people Violet will ever love are her kids. I am very thankful that the show has decided to show her falling in love. I think it's actually pretty great. Um, it, I, I, I also just think it's Ruth. I think the actress's name is Ruth. I think Ruth just does such an excellent job as Violet. I, I think I've told you guys, I, I, there've been moments where I've been annoyed with Violet or whatever, but I think Ruth does such a great job with this character. I fall in more and more in love with her. And, um, I don't know. I, I think it's fine to watch her fall in love. The Featheringtons, we're back again. Now, my husband is enjoying the Featheringtons this season because he's like, if they're just there for a comedic plot device, it's fine. Uh, yes, they're doing goofy, silly things. They are very goofy and silly in the books, even more silly in the books, I would say. Less mean in the books and more silly. Um, but y'all, we saw them ad nauseum last season. I don't, and it's so crazy because like, they're now in Penelope's season, which it is, I'm supposed to see her sisters this season. And I'm over here like, y'all, we saw them up and down season two. I don't want to see them anymore. The fact that they are adding in another like, oh, are, are the Featheringtons going to have money? Are they going to lose their money again? I cannot believe we are back. I cannot believe we are back. <laughs> I can't believe 
believe it. I can't believe we have to worry about the Featheringtons and whether or not they're going to have money again. We did that in season two. And now they've added on a fun little twist of they fucking, the sisters are fucking. Uh, baby, everybody in this season be fucking. Okay, like, y'all ain't special. Kate and Anthony got it in multiple times. Anthony was doing that kind of linga, 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 the thing that he loves to do most to Kate, like, in the first 20 minutes. Like, y'all are not special, okay? Let's get to the back of the bus. Like, I've got other characters to care about. So, we've got the two Featherington sisters and the mama. It's not interesting. I don't know why we're back. I don't know why we have to care. Here we go again with Lady Danbury and the Queen and the diamond of the season, something that's no longer interesting and we do not care about. And I do feel like, let's talk about Lady Danbury first. Y'all might know this, I don't know this, but can someone let me know where this show falls in terms of Queen Charlotte? Because when we left Queen Charlotte, Violet and Lady Danbury were not on the best of terms because Lady Danbury had been fucking Violet's papa right? But now we're in this show and they're talking as if everything is okay. Now, something could happen towards the end of the season where Violet and Lady Danbury finally have a talking about like, hey, like, why are you going after my brother? And Violet's like, why'd you go after my papa? Like, maybe the girls are going to fight it out. But it's weird to watch this relationship when we didn't really get much of a resolution, I feel like, in Queen Charlotte. So anyways, I, I don't I don't really know what's going on with Lady Danbury there. Then here she is again with an unplucked lace front. Baby, somebody needs to pluck Lady Danbury's lace front. I have asked, I, I, if I go back and look, I have asked for that lace front to be plucked, plucked season after season, and y'all refuse to pluck it. Now y'all are leaving her with a forehead that's starting down here full. Okay, pluck, pluck the lace front, all right? I just need it. Y'all are doing her wrong. She's too pretty to be looking like that. So Lady Danbury is here again, just being besties with the queen. The queen is here after a beautiful season of development for the queen in, in Queen Charlotte. She's back to being literally no care, just the same person. She's always been diamond of the season, sparkler of the season. It's not interesting moving on. Why do I have to care about the boxer and his wife? Huh? Why is the boxer in the season? He's in every season. Can somebody tell me why the boxer is in the season so much? I can't quite tell why the boxer and his wife are in this show like this. I think it's obviously gonna pay off down the road. My husband was like, oh, maybe Gregory or Hyacinth gets with one of the boxer's kids, but their age difference is crazy. Like those kids, the boxer's kids are baby babies and Hyacinth and Gregory are like 13 and 12 or whatever. So I don't, know where they're going with it. I gotta be honest, I don't know where they're going with it. And if they're trying to just show what happens to people who are commoners and when they join the titled and how that works, we saw that in Queen Charlotte. That's literally what happened to Lady Danbury and her husband. Like we already saw that done, okay? So I don't need it here. I don't know why they're here. I, I don't, they're, they, it's adding nothing to the show. It's only taking away from the show. I don't know why it's here. They seem like lovely people. They seem like a lovely family. Um, and I don't care. They were in season one already. I don't know why they're still here. Okay. The last person I'm really going to dig into is Chrisita Cowper. Sometimes a bitch is just a bitch. I don't understand the very, it's not a recent trend, but this trend of making sure our villains are always humanized. This has happened in a lot of stuff I've watched recently. Um, I watched the new Mean Girls movie and something that also happened in that is they really tried to humanize all of the Mean Girls in a way that the, the, the my Mean Girls version from 2004 simply did not do. Regina George was kind of a bitch. Her friends were kind of bitches and we never needed to get into it. And it kept the story moving and it was so much smarter and funnier and snappier than the more recent version where we had songs from the villains where they were like, I'm a poor girl, no one loves me, so I'm a bitch. Ah! <laughs> we don't need it. We don't, we don't, we don't need it. So now we're humanizing Chrisida, which fine, whatever. But there's, I just, I don't, guys, it's just like, 
everything takes away from our leads. Cressida in the books is a bitch, like the worst, like she's a terrible human and she is the villain of Penelope's book. So I understand why we had to show more of her. So I think they're thinking, okay, Cressida is a person that is definitely Penelope's biggest, you know, rival. So I need to uh, show more of her plot line now and what she's going through and how bad her life really is. And that's why she's such a bad person and she has no friends. So Eloise is her friend. Do y'all not just know bad people? I know people who are just bad people. Sometimes people just be bad people. Like we don't have to make everybody have a sob story. Everyone does not need a sob story. And I would just argue that if we could take away some of these, just some of these people, some of these people, then we could focus on the two people who matter most this season or should matter most this season, which is Penelope and Colin. And we don't have that. So I think that's the end of my rant. I'm trying to think if there was anything else I really wanted to touch upon, but I feel like I got to all of the things I wanted to touch upon. Um, so that's how I'm feeling, y'all. We, we got through episodes one through four. I'm going to be honest. I ranted through some of that because I ranted everything, but am I enjoying it? Yeah, I am. I'm actually having a jolly good time. But again, that comes because this is not my favorite couple. This is not my favorite book. I don't care about these two people. So I'm just having fun watching everybody else. And I feel like it's kind of interesting, but I talk to other people in my friend group and they're also kind of like oh i'm really excited about x y and z couple oh i'm really excited about this couple no one is saying that they're excited about penelope and colin and that's a real fucking shame for the especially for the two leads who i think are putting in a lot of work it's a shame that the season is not letting them shine and i think both of them were having to come for situations where again penelope was for me kind of a hateful in the first two seasons. And then Colin was a puppy dog in the first two seasons. They were already having to do so much work that we needed to see more of them so far in the season and the show's not doing that. But whatever, I'm having a good time, okay? Like I'm gonna keep watching the show. All right, friends, that is it for now. I will see you in about a week or so, starting my episode by episode breakdown. I'm super excited, so I will see you guys in a little bit. Bye.